This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is Admiral James Stavridis. Now, I'm going to read his bio, or a little part of it anyway, because it's, uh, it's so impressive. I don't want to leave out too many details, but he spent 37 years in the United States Navy and was awarded 50 medals during that time, 28 of which are from foreign nations. Well, from 2006 to 2009, he served as the commander of the U.S. Southern Command. And from 2009 to 2013, he served as the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. That's pretty serious. He oversaw global operations, which included operations in Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, and Syria. He also had a lot to do with counter piracy operations and the emerging threat of cyber warfare. Today, he holds a PhD in international relations. He's an author, a speaker, contributor to Time Magazine, and the chief international security analyst for NBC News. He was also the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and is an executive at the Carlyle Group, which is a global investment firm. A lifelong student of the sea, his latest book, The Sailor's Bookshelf, 50 Books to Know the Sea, is out now. He also has a lot of other books out there to include this summer's 2034, a novel of the next world war. And highly encourage everyone to read this book. It is fiction, so it's a novel, but it's really a cautionary tale, and I would say it is speculative fiction. It is looking into the future based off his vast experience in international relations and in the military. So be sure to check out 2034. And you can follow him on Twitter also. And that's S-T-A-V-R-I-D-I-S-J. And now, without further ado, Admiral James Stavridis. Before we get to, to this, uh, which is where I first reached out when I, uh, I, I, as soon as this came out, I read it um, and then reached out and wanted to talk to you about it. Um, but uh, 37 years in the Navy, and that's a, that's a long run. And uh, this really, uh, it's a warning. It's a cautionary tale. It's speculative fiction, I've heard it called as well, um, mm-hmm. because you are looking ahead here, obviously, to 2034. Um, but uh there's an amazing story that uh, your grandparents coming to this country uh, and they were, they were, they came here from Turkey in the 1920s. Um, mm-hmm. hey, they made, I think they made their way to Athens first, then over to Ellis Island. And then you got to go back, explore some of that history at a, at a certain point. But, uh, and then so what, 70 years later, after they arrive here, you command a U.S. warship and take it into Turkey. Um, yeah. I mean, just incredible. Um, but what, what drove, what was going on for people that are listening? What was going on in that part of the world at the mm-hmm. time that, uh, that drove them uh, down to, to Athens and then over to the, to the United mm-hmm. States? Um, in the 1920s, um, the Ottoman Empire broke apart. And uh, as a result, there was a great deal of atrocities committed, frankly, on on both sides between Greeks and Turks. This is also the period of time, Jack, where the Armenian population is massacred by the Turks. So my grandparents were ethnically Greek, but they lived in, as you said, Western Turkey near the city of Smyrna, which today is called Izmir. So the Turkish army was sweeping down the West Coast, pushing back the Greeks who had invaded. Typical war situation, not unlike what we see today in Syria or Afghanistan. My grandparents were herded uh, as the city was burning behind them down to the quay wall. They were standing literally on the docks, city burning behind them. There were two young people, and they were carried away by Greek fishermen who came across the Aegean to try and rescue as many as they could, not unlike Dunkirk, for example. That's how they came across 1922 to Athens. Then they took ship to the United States of America. Here's the punchline of the story. That was 1922. In 1994, just over 70 years later, their grandson, that would be me, comes back to those Turkish waters. Um, in command of a billion-dollar U.S. warship. 
and you ask yourself, 70 years, what happened in the middle, um, this country did. And mm -hmm. then later, by the way, I went on, of course, to be Supreme Allied Commander in NATO, and the Turks were very concerned. Oh, here's this Greek American. He's the grandson of refugees who were driven out of Turkey. The first capital I visited as a NATO commander was Ankara. Mm -hmm. I went to Turkey to say to them that we need to remember the past, but not be imprisoned by it. We can rise above it. And as, as you well know, through your own combat experience, uh, we fought alongside the Turks in many, many places, including Afghanistan, where they had control of uh, Kabul for much of the four years I commanded the mission. So uh, my roots in Turkey go deep. My family history goes deep. Uh, but we got to remember that part of the past, but look to the future, be inspired by the future, by these kind of stories. Yeah, but I've heard you say that before about uh, comprehending the past, but not be imprisoned by it. And I think it's a, that's a, uh, a wise thing to remember uh, when we're diving into the pages of history, um, or not even the pages of ancient history, just uh, <laughs> over the last 10 years, 20 years even. <laughs> but um, uh, so when they got here, when your grandparents got to, to Ellis Island, what did they, what was that story for them? What, 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 what did they do when they stepped off that boat, they signed their names in the ledger, and what was their path forward then? Well, the first thing you do, by the way, you you get a physical, which you would want that as an American. You'd want someone who is trying to emigrate here to have a complete physical. Once you pass the physical and you pass the, if you will, the background check of the day, you would then surrender your return ticket. Because when you came over uh, under the immigration laws of those days, you had to have a round trip ticket in your pocket so that if you failed the physical, you could just get on the boat and go back. So you surrendered that return ticket. Here's the point of mentioning that, Jack. If you go to Ellis Island and you have a relative who came through Ellis Island, you can call up on the computer at Ellis Island a photograph of the return ticket from your grandparent, your parent, your great-grandparent. So I was able to do that. Look at the return ticket that my grandfather had that would have brought him back. And you look at that ticket and you think, how lucky am I that he passed the physical, that he stayed here. Um, in terms of what he did, like many of that generation, you've seen the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. <laughs> um, he opened a diner. He opened a diner in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, I had a chance to get through that diner at times as a young man, um, and, and he passed away, and my grandmother ran it briefly, and then that was the end of the diner. Um, but it, it's very interesting to say he came here a refugee, opened a small business, had a successful small business. His son was a colonel in the Marine Corps and fought World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and his grandson a Navy officer went on to be a Supreme Allied Commander in NATO. What other country in the world has opportunity like that? Exactly. I think about that every every single day. Um, the Irish from our ancestors came over and we have a, a link back to the Revolutionary War, to Daughters of the wow. American Revolution, Sons of the American Revolution, um, you know, for the for the kids so they can have a connection, that touch point to that uh to where we started really as a as a as a nation. Um and so then your your father for World War II, was he already in the military on uh, December seventh? Or how did that No, how did that a work? great guess. He was just graduating from high school. So okay. he went down to the recruiting station. Uh, for the U.S. Marine Corps and signed up um, to be a U.S. Marine. Wow. And then they gave all the new recruits, if you will, a battery of tests, and he scored very high on this uh, test. And so they then sent him to college to become a Marine officer. So in those days, in World War II, the, the Department of Defense, imagine this today, requisition seats at every university in the country. So my grand, my father, who's this poor Greek kid from uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, goes to Cornell University in 1941. And he's there from 41 through 43. And then he is in the pipeline to head off to, uh, to the war. Uh, and then by the time he gets through the 
the degree and his commission. He gets to the Pacific and then the war ends. Wow. So he doesn't have a big combat record in World War II. And, and Jack, I think that's the reason, as opposed to demobilizing, he decided to stay in the Marines. Mm-hmm. He wanted that experience, that, that combat experience, frankly, yep. uh, that you and I understand so well. And so he stayed in the Marine Corps, got promoted to uh, captain in the Marines, uh, 03. Korean War comes along, and he has a very distinguished combat record wow. in the Korean War. And then his career continues, accelerates. He goes all the way up to uh, full colonel, and he commands a uh, reinforced Marine battalion in uh, central Vietnam, 67-68. Uh, and then, and then after that, he retires uh, because he really felt like he had he completed the voyage. He'd gone all the way to 06. You know, in so many ways, 06 is like the perfect rank. You, you're mm-hmm. insulated from the, the politics of senior leadership, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's the last time you really command troops in the field. Um, he felt he'd done everything he wanted to do, and, and he retired. And then he went off and became an educator and uh, got a Ph.D. in uh, education at Arizona State and became the president of a community college. That was his second career, did that for a couple of decades and, and then became a tennis bum down in Florida. <laughs> so a, a great, a great American life. That is, that's a solid run right there. And sure uh, growing up, did you have to pull some of those stories out of him about uh, Korea or Vietnam or did you do that? Or did he share some lessons with you growing up or how, how what was that I, I, like? tried and that was just not uh, Mm -hmm. a door he wanted to open. And I think that's, and you, you can identify with this. It's different for each of us, depending Mm -hmm. on the character of our service and our own personalities and our families. It was just for my father. It was what he did to serve the country, but no, he was never going to tell me what it was like, you know, marching up the Korean peninsula in the middle of a winter. Um, I, I, what I know of it, I gleaned from photographs. Mm. He, he took a lot of photographs. He kept those. I have those now. He passed away some years ago, but through those photos and, and, uh, and, and my own study of history, um, I think I have a pretty good understanding of, of his experiences, which were very different. The Korean War was a very hand-to-hand kind of combat, as you well know, and, and with which you're quite familiar uh, by the time you get to Vietnam, it's a different story. You're, he's in 05, 06 in command. Um, so a different experience. But uh, I think he represents kind of that spectrum of military engagement from being a very junior enlisted to being a, a you know, kind of an 03, 04 role you know extremely well in frontline combat to, to being a, a senior commander in the field. Yeah, that's and what I love about the stories about these guys that did those sorts of things is they came back, they left military service, and then they did these amazing things yeah. afterward. Um, yeah. And a lot of times they didn't talk about that first yeah. experience at all. Right. And we we saw that in uh, in Pearl Harbor here with my daughter talking to the to these guys, um, to these sixty three veterans that we took out there because we had every meal with them, we helped them mm-hmm. on and off the bus, we sat with them on the bus to and from all these events, got them to the events, sat next to them, and so we got to hear these stories. And a lot of them didn't even talk about World War II until recently. And yeah. it was a lot of it was because of that they went back to Normandy or they went to Iwo Jima yes. or they went to Pearl Harbor. Uh, and they went to these places for the first time, again, from the last time they were there in the 40s. Uh, yeah. And they started talking about these stories. Um, there was one veteran that was with us, Jack Holder. And he was uh, mm. at the end of Pearl Harbor in those hangars at the end. So he took, the runway took one of the first bombs as the as the Japanese mm. came over the mountains and they, they strafed him on the runway there and he dove into a sewer ditch and then he gets up and runs to the water and he watches and he sees them bank and he sees them come into Pearl Harbor and he sees them release the torpedoes. And wow. It, it, incredible guy. Uh, he turned 101 or 100 on our, on our trip. We had a couple birthdays on our, on our trip here. Um, but then he was a PBY uh, uh, mm-hmm. pilot. So he, got, he then went on to sink a Japanese submarine uh, mm-hmm. and helped sink a Japanese carrier. And then they send him over to the English Channel and the Atlantic and he sinks a German uh, submarine over wow. there. And he never talked about it wow. until 10 years ago. 
Uh, and so when he's 90, he finally starts talking about this, this sort of thing. Uh, That's but an incredible amazing guy. story. Yeah, he wrote, yeah he, I was he, just yeah. chatting with a friend of mine who's uh, slightly younger than I am in his uh, early 50s. And his dad is in his early 70s. And he and his dad went to Vietnam and did a motorcycle trip together wow. uh, down, down Vietnam. And same thing that you're describing. He finally got his dad to open up and talk about his combat experiences, which were profound. Yeah. As a young officer in the Marines, this older gentleman that I'm describing was at uh, Hue during the Tet Offensive. And so really, true boy, that's a tough one. You know, if you want to read a good kind of hand-to-hand -hand kind of book, uh, Mark Bowden, who wrote Black Hawk mm -hmm. Down, among other superb books. Mark Bowden has a new book, relatively new, came out, I think, a year ago called Way, uh, about the Ted Offensive that is really worth a read. I'm going to read it. It's on my shelf, but I have not uh, have not read it yet. It's been, been a busy year. Um, you, ought to, you ought to invite Mark Bowden I, on your podcast. That's he a great idea. A terrific guest for you. I think I'm going to do that. Know, he's I'll... not a journalist, but... Mm -hmm. You know, so often I and and you did as well. You you know, you're in the you're in the danger zone. You know, there's danger close, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And you look around, and you know, you're all tricked out in your gear, and you've got protective around you, and and yet over here is some skinny journalist with an, you know, a, a what he thinks is going to protect him in terms of body armor and a helmet that's off to one side, <laughs> and and they're there with it, you know, like a phone filming yeah. stuff. Uh, it takes oh, yeah. a lot of courage to do that kind of stuff. That's Mark Bowden. He'd be good on oh, your show. That's great. I'm going to, I'm going to invite him on for sure. Uh, and I love those stories from those guys. Cause you know, they don't, they don't get orders to go somewhere in this logistics yeah. chain that backs them up and their planes taken care of. They have to figure out a lot of times how to get into totally. these countries that are, uh, yeah. not very easy to get into. Sometimes there's visas, sometimes they're not. Sometimes you're sneaking oh. in, you're getting taxis, yeah. you're finding a fixer, you're yep. dealing with the language, you have the, of the you danger, of course. And now it's not like it was, let's say, let's say 50 years ago, um, uh, where you weren't targeted as a journalist. Like things have changed, yeah. uh, particularly yeah, since 9-11. Sure. And now you might be a target, just like medical yeah. oh, personnel. And Big time. My friend, uh, a good friend of mine is on NBC. He's the chief uh, foreign affairs guy, Richard Engel. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is, I'm telling you, he's the real deal. He's like maybe 40 um, he's been captured and held by terrorists and escaped. He's been in every danger spot in the world. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of courage to do what those folks do. And they do it to, you know, to tell us the truth, to, to, to show us what's going on. I don't know, you know, you and I both follow very closely the tragedy of the fall of Afghanistan. And a lot of that reporting came out of a, a brilliant woman journalist, Clarissa Ward, I think is her name. Mm -hmm. Um, on CNN, I mean, you yeah. know, who's just marching up to these Taliban, shoving a camera in their face. Um, yeah, you know, I was watching that. I was worried. I was concerned for her. I was her. worried for yeah. her. I was too. Jeez. I was too. I was watching that with my wife and I was like, oh yeah, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, same reaction. Ugh. But uh, yeah, I love, I love talking to those guys, particularly because they're going in one person, maybe two, maybe they have a photographer with them, uh, that sort of a thing. Well, uh, they're like seals, Jack, yeah. you know? <laughs> Without all the weapons and the AC-130 and the Predator and, the and all that stuff. Yeah, and the Reaper and everything else that's supporting you these days. But uh, that's why I love it because uh, it kind of yeah. harkens back to the earlier days, maybe that yeah. somebody would have done something like that. Uh, yeah. You know, Vietnam, Korea, left behind in the For Philippines, sure. maybe in the World War II, that sort of a thing. Um, but so was your path, was it, uh, was it almost preordained or did you, from an early age, were you focused on military service or did that come? I was. That was early age. How, was. how did that path, early. what did that path look like for yeah, you? Yeah, early on, I just, like a lot of young men in particular, I think, but, but young men and women, I just wanted to be like my dad. I just wanted to be an infantry officer in the U.S. Marine Corps. And so I actually went off to Annapolis with the idea of becoming an infantry officer, as, as you know, but for your listeners, the Naval Academy provides both Navy and Marines, um, both of the sea services, as we say. So I went off thinking I was going to be a, an infantry officer like my dad. After your first year, your so-called plebe year, um, the Naval Academy then sends you out to sea and they put me on a destroyer in San Diego. And I, my first watch was up on the bridge right at sunset as the ship was sailing out of San Diego Harbor. And 
you know, I was like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. You know, the <laughs> scales dropped from before my eyes. All that light and sun and the sea. And all of a sudden, I just wanted to be a sailor. Wow. And, you know, I went home and told my dad, you know, dad, I've, I've had a little career change of heart here. I'm not going to be a Marine. And uh, he, I got to tell you, Jack, he was pretty sad. Really? Uh, wow. Yeah, he, he got over it. He got over it, you know, about the time I put on my first star. <laughs> well, maybe that was a couple a of years decision. later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like 25 <laughs> years later. But uh, it became kind of the family joke between us, as you can imagine. But um, in, in many ways, I'm glad I did do something like my dad, but also kind of different than my mm -hmm. dad. So. Uh, yes, I always wanted to be in the military for many years, wanted to be a Marine officer, still have a lot of Marine DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, the sea captured me. I wanted to be a mariner more than anything. Interesting. And, and what, uh, what year was that, that you're do taking that, uh, uh, doing that, that, that voyage and then when yeah, you were to graduate I got, from the I academy? Got, I walked in the door at Annapolis in 1972 and in the summer of 73, I went out to sea for the first time. I, I'd never been on a boat, literally. You know, we're a Marine Corps family. You know, we went camping. Um, and so finally, I'm on this huge destroyer going out to sea. And it just it just captivated me. And so I went back to the academy and sort of made the change to become a surface warfare officer. I never really looked back after that. Graduated in Annapolis in 76. And and then a long, long career in destroyers, cruisers, aircraft carriers, all the typical wow. surface line kinds of commands. Wow, that's amazing. So you have about 15 years then, and more if you count your time at Annapolis, um, where you're focused really on the, the Soviet threat in the in the Cold yes. War, of course, oh, which the Navy obviously is a, a huge a part of that with our, our technology deterrence, for power projection, everything else that goes uh, along with it. Um, over that time, how did, how did that experience of those, let's say 15 years, um, inform what you would do later as, uh, as commander at NATO, um, and, and having dealt with that Soviet threat for so long. And what did it feel like to see to, at, at, in the early nineties, to see everything that happens with the Soviet union and see the, yeah. uh, or hear about maybe, uh, the Soviet flag going down for the last time at the, yeah. at the Kremlin. Like, what did that feel like after having devoted what most people would look at as a very significant portion of a, uh, yeah. uh of your time in uniform, uh, towards that threat. So to see that yeah. threat dissipate, mm. disintegrate, um, morph into something yeah. that it would become later. But what did that feel like? Cause you're still fairly junior then. Oh Yeah. So I was um, entirely focused, um, like my generation, on the Soviet Navy, on its capabilities, which were profound. Uh, the Soviet Navy uh, had superb capability, lots and lots of different kinds of ships, submarines. You know, we've all seen Hunt for Red October. Um, it was a formidable a formidable Navy. And I, I mean, I memorized every ship class because you had to, to be a tactical action officer to command your ship and so forth. So flash forward to uh, now I'm at the 15, 16 year point in my career. It's 1989-ish, 1990-ish, and the wall comes down. It, it's disorienting. It's pleasing. You're, you had a sense of, of real victory. But it is also concerning because you ask yourself, are my skill sets relevant? Mm. You know, I've, I've spent my career preparing for combat with this opponent who no longer exists. What will happen now? And really, if you think about the next 10 years before we get to 9-11 and, and with shocking clarity, we have a new mission. But that next 10 years is a very unsettled period in American foreign policy in many ways. Um, what we think of, I think primarily in terms of our mission set, yours and mine, is um, the Gulf War and Saddam Hussein. And this becomes a, a kind of entree to the Middle East, never thinking we're going to spend you know 20 years, forever wars and all of that. So the Cold War, yes, foundational block, the wall goes down. There's a period where we're just kind of resetting the table. The Persian Gulf War occurs. That's very successful. Obviously, we make a good decision, I think, not to hang around. And then 9-11 comes, and, and we all know that 20 years of history. 
Jeez. And where were you on 9-11? Uh, Jack, I was in the Pentagon. I was on the side of the Pentagon that the airplane hit. It struck about 150 feet to my right. I, I was on the exterior wall of the Pentagon in my boss's office. I glimpsed just something metallic and a flash and then a bang, as the saying goes, flash bang. And, you know, we all fell down. Uh, you know, it was like a, a, a typical explosion. Um, to be honest, I thought it was a truck bomb. Mm. Um, I, I didn't realize it was actually an airplane, even though I caught a glimpse of it, because that would have been so incomprehensible. Right. We knew at that point, of course, that the Twin Towers had been hit. So I think probably in track two in my brain, mm. I was thinking, is that possible? But I, who knows? Anyway, you know, smoke, fire, you know, as you and I both know, every sailor is a trained firefighter. So, you know, we move out toward the toward the smoke, toward the fire, try to help. What can you do? Immediately overcome by the smoke. Nothing you could do. We backed out, went down to the grassy field. The heroes of the day, you know, the first responders show up. We tried to do what we can for the, the dead and the wounded out there. Um, you know, it's ironic. I always say this, you know, I had my share of dangerous situations in 37 years in the military. The closest I came to getting killed was 9-11. But here's the ironic part. At that moment, I was in the safest place in the world, right? I'm in the Pentagon. It's a huge concrete fortress guarded by the strongest military in the world. I'm in the capital of the richest country on earth. Was I safe? No. And I think that is kind of a metaphor for life. Just when you think you're really safe, something will jump up in your life. And I think it's a metaphor for the nation in that we have to be prepared for the unexpected. And who would have guessed all the events that unfolded or that 9-11 itself could have occurred? Jeez. Yeah, that's... Uh, Where uh, were you? Uh, I was in Guam. It was my second deployment as a SEAL. So we were two weeks into it and uh, it was about midnight in Guam and we didn't have TVs in our room. We had a TV in the basement, but about midnight, uh, phones start ringing. We did have phones in our rooms back then. No one had cell phones uh, that I can remember anyway. And uh, people start banging on the doors, waking everyone up in the in the hallway of the barracks. Uh, I was in E5 at this point. And uh, we go down to the basement and we watch the Twin Towers fall on television. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, I go with, uh, I think the next day, maybe two days later, um, because I was the intelligence rep for the platoon. I was, a, I was just an, interested in that stuff my, my whole life. And then I went to IS school in, uh, to become an ISA in um, uh, Damneck, Virginia before BUDS because you had to do have a source rating at the time. Um, and I think all my Tom Clancy reading really prepared me because it was still focused on the Cold War. Even then, 1996, sure. fall of 1996, I go to Intel school and it's all the, you know, the black silhouettes and you have to identify what plane and carrier exactly. and all that stuff. And I could do that because of all the Tom Clancy stuff and then the accompanying books that he wrote on the nonfiction yes. side of the house. Um, yeah. So I was very well prepared for uh, for that. I don't think I really, I think I could have just um, tested out of it if that had been an option before before Buds. But um, uh, so as it, obviously I'm still, I've always been, been interested in terrorism for whatever reason I thought, because my earliest memories are of uh, um, the Iranian hostage crisis and seeing our uh, uh, diplomats and and uh, uh, military members blindfolded, being these black and white pictures. I'm so young at the time, but I see Time Magazine, I see Newsweek Magazine, we have a, the newspaper and I was just drawn to this. Uh, I remember them taking us to church so that we could uh, we could pray for for them when I was a kid, my first grade class or kindergarten class. Um, and uh, so I was just always Marine Beirut uh, barracks bombing that very yeah. impactful to me. And then uh, uh, TWA hijacking and then, of course, Pan Am 103 later on when I'm a little older. Um, but all these things just for whatever reason. Um, they're very impactful and then let me know that, Hey, this is going to be what you do in the future. This is, this, yeah. this is what you're, this is, this yeah. is your focus. So it always was. So, um, so right off the bat, not many people knew what Al Qaeda meant. They didn't know about the base. They yeah. didn't know much no. about Osama bin Laden. Um, but I had read a lot about him and studied these things. And, uh, so I gave a brief that next day. I remember to the, the commander of our uh, unit one in Guam. And then I think it was the next day 
where they put me and one other guy on a plane with the uh, Commander Sync Pack Fleet. They used to still call them uh, that at the time. Yeah. And we went to the Philippines. Uh, we went to a few other other countries, and I was just a, essentially a bodyguard for him uh, as yeah. he went and kind of shored up relationships with some of these other countries that that might be uh, important in the future. Yeah, um, that yeah. that became a, a, one of the most important aspects of the post immediate post 9-11 was the activation of the NATO alliance, for example. Mm-hmm. That's when NATO came to our defense. There were German fighters flying over New York City. There were British destroyers in our home waters. I'll tell you, when I first heard of bin Laden was not 9-11. I heard of bin Laden several years earlier when I was a commodore in command of a group of destroyers. And um, I was tasked with a Tomahawk mission to try and kill bin Laden. And it was after the bombings in East Africa. Mm -hmm. And we then sighted him in Afghanistan. And so I launched a bag of tomahawks, um, and we just missed. We just wow. missed killing him by no by inches. The Pakistanis yeah. gave him a warning, we believe. Who knows? Um, so, again, irony, um, I tried to kill bin Laden, yeah. and bin Laden came back and tried to kill me. I used wow. to have a recurring dream when I was the NATO commander that somehow in some weird way, I would be involved in the mission that would finally kill bin Laden. But of course, it was our brave Navy SEALs who ultimately finished the job for us. And you must know many of them. I do. I do know quite a few guys are on that mission. And uh, yeah, they tell me they thought it was a one way. They, uh, in, in their heart of hearts, they thought they were not coming back from that one, which uh, says a lot about Amazing. them to get on those helicopters yep. and, and oh. go in to, to do that. Amazing story. And losing a helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> and looking back, you know, history. Desert One, you were speaking a moment ago about Iranian hostages. Mm -hmm. We lose a helicopter and the mission goes down. Here, we lose a helicopter, but we pull it off and we bring everybody back and we bring bin Laden back in a bag and dump him in the Indian Ocean where Mm -hmm. he resides today. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And uh, yeah, the ghosts of Desert One definitely impact a lot of special operations thinking. Uh, Continue to this day. I agree with that. Let me tell you something about that. When I was commander U.S. Southern Command, um, all of Latin America, Caribbean, I had uh, a hostage situation down there. Three contractors had been captured by the FARC in Colombia. So we were constantly trying to figure out a way to have a mission to go rescue them. And I went to, obviously, to my special operations component and the what struck me about it was the first time I, as a four star, I'd really had direct uh, impact on a special operations mission, high visibility one. And what struck me, here's your point, was the meticulous planning. I mean, they built, you know, a village that was a mock up of this FARC camp down to the doorknobs and were completely focused on that. And this idea that SEALs, uh, or, you know, just red dots on foreheads, uh, just making it up as they go along is the most ridiculous notion in the world. I've never met a more planning centric community than special ops. I think a lot of it comes out of desert one. I think so. I think you're right. Uh, special operations in general, they think about yep. hey, what uh, getting to and from the target and that, that translates down, not just to overall strategic planning, but even just getting into, into Ramadi, just a couple, a mile in, you think about to and from that target and the, the dangers posed, uh, whether it's by helicopter or gun truck or whatever else, that was one of my top priorities, uh, leading missions in, in Ramadi or anywhere really in Iraq or Afghanistan was getting to and from that target. Um, cause for years we also did practice. We magically arrived at our target. Um, for a long time. And we did a lot of, okay, we're there in our, at the time in the nineties in a flight suit with some uh, body armor on, and we're there and we're ready to make entry into this structure and we go and we do it. Um, and that, that is so important to do those runs, yeah. but yeah. for a little before, after nine 11, it became very apparent that, okay, maybe this nine millimeter MP5 that we magically showed up with at this door. Well, maybe when we're flying or we're driving through Afghanistan and we're at 10,000 feet or whatever it is, uh, we get in a gunfight on the way to the target, or we lose a vehicle or a helicopter on the way to the target or from, uh, maybe we need something else. Maybe that M4 is a little bit better. So anyway, there was, there was, uh, there, there was definitely a little, but we're always learning. We're always adapting. And that's yeah. what, uh, what, and that's part of what is in here too, that learning, that adapting. Um, and, uh, but before I get to, to that 
that piece of it. Um, when you're out on that grass after the the first plane, that plane hit the, the Pentagon, um, when you're watching this thing burn, you're seeing the smoke, maybe some bodies are coming out. Um, what's going through you? What are you, what, what rank are you and what is your position there? And then what, what are you I'm thinking? I'm a one star. You're I'm a one star. One star. I, I had just pinned on my one star um, uniform, if you will. And the, the main thing going through my mind, I think like most of us was anger, was anger. And um, just immediately thinking, okay, what's our role? How are we going to do this? Where are we going to go? And at the time, I was kind of in a, a section of the Navy staff uh, focused on strategy. And the uh, chief of naval operations, Vern Clark, said, Stavridis, you are going to uh, stand up uh, our tactical fighting cell in the Pentagon. It was called Deep Blue. Wow. And the idea was, back to the point you made earlier, Jack, um, we had a Navy that was still very focused on blue water operations containing the Soviet Union. We'd done a little bit of offshore kind of stuff in, in D Desert Storm, but we were not prepared for the war on terror. So my job for the first year of the war was get the smartest people in the Navy and Admiral um, Clark said, just pick anybody you want. I, I had a cell of about 15 people, but the smartest people, I had mm. the, the best seal. For mm. example, the seal that I had was uh, uh, a commander named Bill McRaven. I often <laughs> wonder whatever happened to Bill Yeah, what happened McRaven. to that guy? <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, and I had his equivalent as an aviator, as a submariner, wow. as an amphibious guy. So I had this superstar group and we spent a year reimagining how naval forces would engage in a war on terror and specifically find and kill bin Laden and go to Afghanistan. Um, so that was my first year. And then uh, at that point, then they sent me to sea as the as the strike group commander for Enterprise Carrier Strike Group. So wow. I went forward into combat, and um, it, and both Iraq and Afghanistan by that time were up in arms. And wow, um, so that was my start to the war. Wow, that is incredible. And Bill McRaven remains one of my my great friends. Oh, today. wonderful! I mean, yeah, he's done Nobody. so. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And Eric, my other great SEAL friend is Eric Olson. Oh, I'm great! Black Hawk Down. Mm -hmm. um, as I always say about Eric Olson, he's a man of normal height like me. <laughs> I'm like five six on a really good day. So Eric and I see everything eye to eye. That's funny. <laughs> but those are my two SEAL buddies. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, you you have two good ones there. You have, you have two yeah, good ones in your sure. in your arsenal there. Yeah. Um, gosh, that's amazing. And so, where do you physically go? Where do you put this now that the the Pentagon's on fire? It's burning. It's been hit. Did did um did people go back into the usable spaces fairly soon thereafter? Yeah. Really? Immediately, immediately. Um, with, you know, the, the Pentagon's an amazing building. And I've never been those there. Who haven't been there? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a you know, it's a massive building. Twenty five thousand people work there, and you know, a fully loaded, fully fueled jumbo plane hit the side of it. Um, but frankly, eighty five percent of the Pentagon was perfectly usable the next day. It smelled like smoke. It smelled like jet fuel, um, but everyone went back into the Pentagon and the part that was destroyed, the, the department of defense went to crystal city walking distance and just rented big high rises and took all, everyone whose office got blown up like mine. We just worked out of crystal city. And then uh, I was only there for a few weeks when we stood up deep blue. So then I was back in the Pentagon in a kind of a smoky, you know, jet fuel smelling space. I'll tell you a funny story about that, which is that I was in my service dress blues. So as you know, an admiral has a, a very thick gold mm -hmm. braid over there. And those things are expensive. <laughs> and uh, and after I came running out of the building and, and was out there in that field, um, my uniform was so smoky, it was it was completely ruined. But I cut those gold stripes off because I wanted to keep them wow. and wear them throughout the rest of the war. Wow. 
and because they were expensive. <laughs> and so I took them and I bought a new service dress blue, but they, the, in fact, the set that I have downstairs, which now I have a four star admirals, but it's still that original one star thick band. Wow. There that was in nine 11 with me at the Pentagon. I'll tell you one other thing in my office there. Um, the whole office was burned out, but one thing survived. And it's a funny thing. It, it was it is my letter sweater from the Naval Academy. I lettered in tennis at the Naval Academy. And when the when my office got hit, the chair, the letter sweater was on the back, and the chair spun around so that the the letter, the N was pressed up against the wall, no oxygen. So when I finally got back in there, the only thing left, I pulled the chair out and there was my very smoky, covered with soot in, and that's in a frame right around the corner here. Wow, that is incredible. Geez, well, well you, you let it in tennis, that's quite civilized. Um, Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I, if I was a SEAL, I'd say I lettered in wrestling. That's right. <laughs> boxing. <laughs> That's right. I'm trying to think if there are any SEALs I know that uh, that play tennis Rifle, at the academy. They probably ball. there probably are, but I just yeah, don't know. Uh, probably not on the tennis. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. My my family plays. My wife loves tennis. Our, my, our oh, kids love tennis. Sport. I think it's great. You can play and it here's forever. The great thing. The great thing about tennis is you can play at a very competitive intercollegiate level. But now I'm in my 60s and I still go out and hit and have a great, it's a lifetime sport. Yep, yep. Um, and I feel for guys that are, you know, like football players, you know, you play football for four years, but, you know, you're not going to play football in your 40s and 50s and 60s. Exactly. That's why I try to encourage our kids, tennis, golf, sailing, yeah. things that you're going to do forever. Your whole life. Exactly. Your whole life. Exactly. What sports did you play in high school? Uh, so I ran cross country in grade school. And I, I, I look, listen, I think uh, going through buds, I thought back on those cross country runs. There's something about just running long distance where you're just mm -hmm. pushing yourself, where it's very easy yeah. to stop. Uh, yeah. where it's the same thing as buds, very easy to ring that bell, especially during yeah, hell week yeah. when we put it in the trailer hitch and you can right. see it for the entire week. You don't have to run anywhere yeah. to get to it. It's right there. Um, yeah. as you know, um, but, uh, same thing with long distance running. Like you can just quit anytime and feel a little bit better, but you don't, you keep pushing, yeah. you keep moving nice forward. Play. So I think that really impacted me, but then I played soccer my whole life and, uh, and lacrosse as well. Were, were you, which are to me are kind of seal like sports, but did, did you also swim? Was swimming a, a big challenge for you at Buds or had you always been a, a good swimmer? Were you on a swim team? I was on a swim team as a kid, but I was not very good at it. It wouldn't be one of the things that I list at, like I'm good at running. I'm good at moving through the back country with a, a, with weight on my back. Like I've always been good at those things. Uh, swimming did not come natural to me when I was young or in Buds. Uh, in yeah. particular, because we have that strange stroke that we now we teach them. I think now they go to Great Lakes and they actually learn how to do this combat side stroke. Well, yeah. back when I went through, it was just you push you in and they tell you about it a little bit and then you're just supposed to do it. And it's this, uh, yeah. you know, it's a side stroke up here, as you know, with your upper body, yeah. but then your yeah. legs are doing a flutter kick, but you're on your side and you're underwater right. and you just come up. So it's not one that you, if you were on a swim team, uh, that you yeah. would have, have learned. <laughs> um, but if you swam like in college or played water polo or something and were just super comfortable in the water, um, yeah. you can adapt pretty yeah. quickly. But for me, I didn't learn the technique because they didn't teach the technique back then. Now yeah. we do. Um, so I struggled through that first phase, barely making it on the swims. Then somebody took me aside. One of these guys that who had played water polo in college. And we went out after one day and went out in the ocean and he just taught me the technique. And after that, I was, I was fine. Um, and I grew up in the water, free diving for, uh, for Avalone up in the Northern California coast and got a scuba dive very early in life. So I was comfortable in the water. I just couldn't get this stroke and I was never a great competitive swimmer. Um, so that was probably the toughest part of buds for me was just the worry of not being yeah. as good at that as I was at running the obstacle course or running sand, running the sand or the shooting or whatever else yeah. it, it was. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting, uh, thing, especially when you have the cold, obviously, as you know, and you oh. throw you in the cold and it's, uh, <laughs> it's yeah, good, I, good times though. Good times. Yeah, but, uh, but for the kids, I, I do love that they're on the tennis court and they're here in park city, they're skiing and they're doing all that, uh, that sort of thing. But, uh, those lifelong sports is what I try to encourage uh, them and then other kids to, to do as well. Um, so I think that's just, just, uh, that just makes, that just makes sense. Um, but, uh, w at what point do you take over as, uh, as commander of NATO? Um, and what was that path like? Was that something that you thought was on the horizon for you at a certain point or was it a surprise or no, how did that work? No, no, not at all. Um, 
for, first of all, I always say the three most random things in the Navy are early selection, flag selection, and the awarding of medals. I, I think those are largely random processes. <laughs> so I, I take no credit for any of that. But um, I, I, I guess I had an expectation as a young officer that I would become a ship captain. Mm-hmm. That's what I really wanted. You know, it'd be like being a a SEAL 05 in command of one of the SEAL right. uh, teams, you know. Um, and and that was important to me. Once I had been a captain and I had a successful tour as a captain and led my crew into combat and all that, um, everything after that was kind of, okay, we'll see what happens next. I had no real expectations, no real, you know, ambitious path that I was following. Anyway, um, I end up, probably through a computer error as a four-star. And my first four-star assignment, as I mentioned, is Commander U.S. Southern Command. So Latin America and the Caribbean. And I thought that was it. I mean, you know, there's, you're already a four-star. There is no higher rank. And I was a combatant commander. And I was in a part of the world I'm very comfortable in. I was born in South Florida. I speak Spanish and French. I'm very comfortable in Latin America in that world. So I was ready to retire at the end of that. And that would have been in 09. And Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates called me up and said, "Um, Stavridis, we're not done with you yet. I want you to go to NATO. And I honestly thought he had misspoken because if I was gonna get another four-star assignment, it would have been your old stomping grounds, US Pacific Command, because that's where admirals go, Mm -hmm. right? NATO is always a general and Pacific Command is always an admiral. So Gates says, nope, I want to shake things up. I think you're the right guy. Um, You have all this deep blue experience in the war on terror, your strike group tour, you know, all this. Um, And he said, I want you to go to NATO and be the NATO commander. So I went in 09 and I was there for four years. So I, I had the longest uh, tour as a combatant commander, three years at Southern Command, four years as NATO commander, seven, seven and a half years, um, longest in the modern era. Wow. Um, yeah. And I, I loved, you know, my whole career, but being the Supreme Allied Commander in NATO, for starters, it's a great title. It is pretty I, good. It's probably the best title. Yeah. Yeah, I try and get my wife to call me Supremo at home. <laughs> and so far, that's not going not, anywhere. Not yet. Don't give not up. Yet. Um, we'll <laughs> see. Uh, so anyway, what I loved about NATO, three things. I loved the mission, this alliance structure and commanding troops from all these different countries. It's like the Olympics of the military. Um, so I, I love the alliance uh, aspect. Number two, uh, really liked the idea of living in Europe, living in that world. Um, and number three, I it was a very rich mission set. So I had Afghanistan, Libya, remember that war happened on my watch. The Balkans are still in a serious state of mm-hmm. difficulties. Cyber is a constant problem. Piracy. Um, it was very broad spectrum of military operations. And wow. Uh, so that was definitely the culminating point in my career. I, I loved it. Yeah, no, what an incredible place to to be. And of course, so for its first, let's say, 40, 50 years, um, it, it was focused on something different. It had almost a singular yeah. focus, um, focused on the containing the Soviet threat, of course. Um, and then we have 9-11 happens and we have, so we have Afghanistan and then we have Iraq and we have Libya and all these things you're dealing with on, on your watch. But um, so now it really, and correct me if I'm wrong, it exists to defend all the the NATO members in in general, it seems like it's that shifted from that yes. containing that Soviet threat to okay, what are these new threats and how are we going to adapt Correct. to them going going forward? We still have Russia, of course, to uh, to focus on, but uh, now we have, like you said, cyber. We have terrorism. We have nation states that maybe NATO members don't want to have nuclear capability, um, maybe Iran and North Korea. Um, but uh, what did you learn over your your time there? I mean, that's a that's a long time dealing with every single one of our allies. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are you, uh, what, what were some of your, your takeaways um, uh, or surprises? And what was that experience like for you? Well, first of all, I was the first admiral to command it. So what I really quickly learned was that this was a very army centric mm, culture. Okay. 
And, and I think the lesson there is for all of us, when we go from a culture that we're very comfortable with, my case, a naval environment, you are the one who has to adapt to the new culture. Even if you're the commander, you're not going to like wrench a culture around. So I had to, I had to adapt and be flexible and learn um, about the broader culture of particularly army centric operations and, and certainly Afghanistan was very much an army centric operation, obviously recognizing the great contribution of Navy SEALs and EOD and Air Force. It was an army centric operation. So first point, adapt yourself to culture. Number two, learn about um, all of your partners. So every time I would go visit uh, Prague or Berlin or London or Madrid, I would read and learn and, and try and understand the military history, try and understand the current politics, the culture um, of those different nations. So being able to meld uh, this group at that time of 28 different nations, today there are 30, uh, together I think was a, a second big uh, takeaway for me. And, and number three was um, the need for a, a better cyber defenses. Um, we, we really were way behind the power curve on that. Um, I think we still are in a lot of ways, Jack. And, and you know, you've touched on this in a number of your books. Um, I have touched on it in 2034, a novel of the next world war begins with a cyber attack. I think that's going to be a feature of war that we have to be more mindful of than we are today. So there's three um, sort of high level takeaways from from my time. I here. mean, yeah, how incredible. Um, geez, but uh, then this last novel that I just finished uh, a few days ago, uh, I went deep into cyber warfare to quantum computing to these levels of the internet to the future of warfare as it pertains, it, fighting it in the cyber space. Um, so all of that, that was a, a large focus of my research for this, uh, this next novel. So um, sure. oh, yeah, that was, it was very interesting for me because that really wasn't my focus um, growing up or my, during my time in the military or anything else. So um, it, it was very interesting to do a deep dive into some of those things that uh, we may or may not be doing as a nation and what some of our adversaries may or may not be doing uh, as well. Um, but while you're, while you are, you are at NATO, um, Afghanistan is already going on. Iraq is already going on, but the Arab Spring happens while you're, while you're there. Yeah. Um, right. What was that like to see that? I mean, it was, was, uh, how much of, I guess, of a warning did you have that things were going to shift dramatically during that time frame? Um, and what were you thinking during that, uh, during that time? It was a shock and uh, no one saw it coming. It starts in Tunisia, a very mm -hmm. tiny little country on the North coast of Africa, central Mediterranean with a fruit seller mm -hmm. who protests the corruption, sets himself on fire. And literally it's like a fire spreading across this region of authoritarian dictators largely who are controlling it, and it upends the entire region. Um, for me at NATO, because I had Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, piracy, everything else, I my initial reaction was, oh my God, here goes one more thing, and sure enough, Libya. So in Libya, you have a circumstance where an Arab dictator uh, Fate, Muammar Gaddafi faces an uprising of his people that he's suppressed for 40 years. And he starts talking about he's going to massacre the population of Benghazi, the second largest city. And so France, UK, United States all say, no, we're not going to allow you to go in and just massacre the population of this country. And so the United Nations gives NATO the job of creating a no-fly zone, of cutting off arms. We're not going to put NATO boots on the ground, but conducting an air campaign to prevent Gaddafi from massacring his own people. We then launch a massive air campaign, tens of thousands of sorties. The rebels are able to uh, hold their positions because of this and ultimately overthrow Gaddafi. So it's a very intense six-month war. At the end of it, Qaddafi is captured. He's killed by his own people. You know, no due process there. You reap what you sow, I suppose. Mm. Um, and here's where the mistake occurs. 
Um, at that point, instead of having the European Union and the United Nations come in and kind of like stabilize the situation, everybody just walks away. And so Libya then falls into chaos, and that's a tragedy. And, and it's still, frankly, got a civil war kind of sputtering along. Um, bottom line, I'm proud of what we did. We did our mission, which was to prevent massacres. Um, Gaddafi paid the price that he deserved to pay. Um, but Libya, unfortunately, to, to wrap this up, Libya is, is very much an example of the results of the Arab Spring, which is to say it's still a mess. Syria is a mess. Iraq is a mess. Egypt is a little bit more stable. Uh, Libya is a complete mess. Tunisia has got problems. You know, it, none of it really improved the region very much. And, and that's unfortunate. I'm not sure the U.S. ought to be the answer to that. But as a, as a, a look across the region, you have to say that the Arab Spring started with a great deal of hope. And it turned out to be anything but an Arab Spring. It's turned into simply a long Arab winter. Yeah, uh, it, it's tough for us, I think, as uh, as Americans to look at it because, of course, we want you know freedom and democracy and and uh, you know choice and capitalism and free markets and uh, opportunity for everyone to follow their dreams, like all oh, that sort of thing. But then you see some of this chaos, and you thought, well, yeah. reverse this by twenty years, thirty years, forty years, and. Yeah, I mean, it's just tough to to wrap your head around it as American when you want these certain things, but then you see the stability that maybe this strong or this these dictators bring in that area of the world, whether they're on your side yeah. or not. Um, right. It's just it, it, it's an interesting problem that there's no doubt about it. It, it is, and I think it it also points Jack to the the limits of American capability. We we can't march around the world setting every wrong right. What we can do is we can try and be a good example ourselves. We can partner with other democratic nations whose values we share, NATO in Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, our partners in the Pacific, South Korea, our partners in Latin America like Colombia and Chile and others. We can partner with them. And uh, thirdly, where we see an opportunity to, uh, to be part of a success story, we should grasp that. But again, we need to recognize the limits of our power. To 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 not recognize those limits is a here's a Greek word. I know you know it, hubris. It is thinking that you can solve every problem. Oh, yes. We cannot. We have to know the limits of our own power. Yep, I actually worked that in the latest novel. Uh, uh, a couple of characters talk about uh, imperial hubris there. But it's interesting yep. that you talk about capabilities and limitations at a strategic level um, because it's important also at that tactical level to understand your capabilities, yes, but also your limitations, uh, whether that's with your force of maybe it's seven guys, 20 guys, 40 guys, whatever that might be, but also as an individual, let's say as a sniper, what is my capability with this weapon system, but also what is my limitation with this weapon system and my own capability? Um, so that it's, it's interesting that at all levels that uh, that plays in and, and are, are important. Um, when did you hear about the uh, embassy annex and embassy in Benghazi and all and, you know, in chaotic situations, how information flows. And oftentimes it's, well, sometimes it's not as good as uh, good news. Isn't as good as you think it is. And oftentimes bad news isn't as bad, but sometimes, sometimes it can be, and it can get, get worse. But, uh, what, as a, as a commander, um, up there, what, what were you hearing about that when that transpired? Benghazi wasn't my operation. Recall that Benghazi is occurring in Africa. So the U.S. commander for that was commander of U.S. Africa okay. Command. My job as U.S. European Command was to support uh, General Carter Ham, mm -hmm. who I think had a responsibility for that mission. So it was one that I observed from a distance, okay. um, tried to support through my American hat, but it was because it was purely an American uh, situation, it didn't fall under my NATO hat. Got it. So- I'd, I'd say that it, it was all part of the kind of chaos and destruction that you saw coming out of the Arab Spring and just part of the ongoing tragedy in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, it, interesting part of the world. And we're still, you know, it's still, it's going to affect us and our okay. foreign policy and decisions we make for generations. Um, okay. I was going to ask you this near the, the end, but um, 
because it, it, I think you gave it your, your TED talk that you gave that I highly encourage everyone to go go and listen to. It holds up ten years later. Um, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, it's funny you say that. I, I I literally watched it today for the first time in years. I did it in 2012, so it's almost ten years old. It's got close to a million views. Just Google yeah. Stavridis and TED Talk; it'll pop mm-hmm. right up. Yeah, it's, so that holds up as do some of the things that you um, when you were talking about Afghanistan in the lead up in early uh, 2021 up to you know let's say midsummer, um, like some of the, the things and predictions that you made and the the hopes that you had um, all seem to have have played out. But in your TED talk, you you it's interesting. So you talk about when you started out, you talk about um, a battle in France in 1916, where over a 300 day period in World War One, 700 thousand. People are killed, 2,000 a day in trench yeah. warfare. Uh, you talk about the Maginot Line, you talk about World War II, you talk about the Battle, Battle of Stalingrad, uh, where over the same 300-day period, 2 million people are, are killed. Uh, and I, I bring those up because of how important it is to study our history, to give, some, to when you're looking at things in relative terms, where we're going, where we've then what lessons can we draw? Uh, and I think that's so important to, for especially our younger generation uh, to study and to listen to, to your talk um, because of how things maybe have progressed and how we can do them better going forward, which is always what we, what we want uh, is, to, is to do things better going forward. Um, but when you think about your time there and you think about those battles, you think about World War I, you think about World War II, you think about the creation of NATO, which then you take your command, um, you look at the Cold War years, um, what do you recommend that uh, that young people, one, the lessons that they take from from that period in history, that hundred year, let's say, period um, in history, uh, and what do you recommend they they read? So what do you, I guess, what do you recommend they, they they read, and what lessons do you hope they internalize as they move forward in in life and take over a lot of these positions that uh, that, that that you held over the last uh, forty years? Yeah, what a what a what a wonderful broad question. Um, first of all, let me just underline the importance of reading, which is where we started this conversation. Both of us grew up lucky enough to have uh, moms, you know, to, probably in both our cases, who really encouraged us to read. My mom's 91. She reads probably two books a week and is um, can, can tell you who her favorite Norwegian author is. I Wonderful. Mean, she's very broadly read. And here's the punchline. She never went to college. Self-taught just self-taught reader, big thinker. Um, So reading is just so crucial to to everybody. In terms of what young people ought to read today, um, I think first and foremost, I I say, be well-informed about current events. And, And that means jumping online every day and taking a look at, um, reputable news sources. And, you know, you get a political spectrum here. Um, I I think the Wall Street Journal is pretty centrist and very balanced in its reporting. Um, But there are a number of different outlets. But um, read every single day. And in particular, once a week, find time to take a look at a magazine, and it's available online, called The Economist. Mm-hmm. And it has no bylines. It's very apolitical. And it's a look at the world, what's happening in the world. So point one, read. Point two, read about the world. And then point three would be, read where your interests take you. So I just finished writing a novel, 2034, a novel of the next world war about a war between the US and China. Yeah, there you go. And to, to get ready, for writing that. Just like Jack, when you get ready to write one of your novels, you do a deep dive into bio warfare or cyber, or you refresh yourself on the Middle East, which you know quite well. Um, I spent a lot of time reading about China. Um, So I did a deep dive reading everything from Henry Kissinger's On China to a new book that just came out called Strategy of Denial Mm -hmm. by Eldridge Colby, which is about Taiwan defending itself. Um, I read novels by both American and Chinese writers in translation to try and understand the literature, the history, the culture. So the point is, rather than give uh, listeners uh, a list of great books to read, I would say 
read what your interests uh, dictate and read deeply and read both fiction and nonfiction. And you know, a book in a lot of ways, just like the Plains Indians say about a river, you never cross the same river twice. What they mean is that the river has flowed by. It's a new river. And, you know, books are like that. You never read the same book twice because you bring yourself completely new set of experiences to, to books. So I'll give you two books that I've read many times. One is um, Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea story of uh, Santiago, a Cuban, poor Cuban fisherman. He goes out to sea, he catches the greatest fish, and then it's destroyed by sharks. And it's a book about resilience. It's a book about the sea. It's a book about what generations owe each other. He has a mentoring relationship with a young fisherman in the village. It is an incredible book in, in so many ways. I highly recommend it. Short read. You can mm -hmm. read it in an evening. And the second book I often recommend to people um, to read and reread as you go through life. Um, again, it's a book you probably read when you were 13 or 14. It's To Kill a Mockingbird, oh, so bad. which is an extraordinary book. It's about, you know, it's set in the 1940s, 30s, maybe. And it's about a black man falsely accused of a rape. Um, it, and, and he's defended by a white man who is told by all the other white people in the town, don't, don't defend this guy. Um, you know, it's a book about race in America. It's a book about integrity. It's a book about moral courage, doing the right thing. And it's all told through the eyes of his daughter. So it's a book about a young woman coming of age. Uh, boy, does that sound like America today? In a lot of ways it is. And so there's two, there's two books that I've loved and, and have read many times, and I, I gain something every time I do that. But the real point is, read. Read endlessly in your life. Yep, I try to encourage that almost every, every day, every chance I get anyway. Uh, if you can see over my shoulder here, this is Hemingway wrote I, a movable feast on this typewriter. Uh, I, and his stuff went, went up for auction in uh, early 2020, and uh, a fan reached out and gave it to me. Um, are you yeah. serious? It's, it has all the documentation and, and all the rest of it and yeah, pictures. That's and amazing. That's, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Wow. So it's right, uh, I'm right there as I'm, as I'm typing away on my MacBook. Uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's right there. And then a bunch of his works over yeah, in my, closest my shelf. I can come, the closest I can come to that story is, uh, down in Key West at the Hemingway house. Um, I did them a favor when I was a four-star admiral they wanted someone to track down the original citation of Hemingway's Bronze Star. He was awarded a Bronze Star as a journalist, kind of offhandedly, for his role in liberating Paris in the Second World War. Mostly, he just opened the bar at the Ritz <laughs> Hotel. But Might be the his, most important thing friend, that happened. Right. His friend, General Buck Latham, gave him a Bronze Star. <laughs> Fine. So... So I tracked down the citation and they have it framed in Key West down there. And as a reward, they let me go into the writing area of the Hemingway house, which is a kind of an area over a garage, over the pool. And so they let me go up there and go behind the glass and sit and type wow. on Hem Hemingway's typewriter from Key West. So wow. kind of like yours. That's incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, but no, it's not like I have that <laughs> typewriter in my house. <laughs> I only typed one thing on it and it's a Hemingway line. So I, it's the one thing I typed That's is to make sure so it still great. worked. And, uh, and so it's still, still on there. Where, right now. where do you live? I want to come visit. <laughs> come on out anytime. Type. Park city, Utah. So Park city. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Next time I'm out, I Let will. Let me know. Let wow. me know. It'd be great to, to, to see you in person and, and, uh, and talk through some fun. of these, some of these things. Speaking of which, uh, you could have written about anything that you wanted here. And with all that experience, 37 years in, everything that you've done after your time in the military, um, you decide to write about, I mean, you have other books out there as well, but in this speculative fiction type of a, a category here, um, you decide to write about this next world war and, uh, yeah. and China and uh, India and uh, technology. Um, so it was very telling to me that you mm. decide to write about this uh, as you, uh, you, you step into the, the fiction, the world of fiction. Um, when did you decide to, that you wanted to do that? 
kind of take a departure from some of the other things that that you've written and uh, and focus on this and take a let's just say a year of your life into the the research and the writing and everything that went into this. Why? What was that that decision like? What what made you want to do this? I I came to write a novel about the future because I was looking at the past in. I look back to the Cold War, which we discussed, and there were so many novels that illuminated the Cold War, including Red Storm Rising Mm -hmm. by Tom Clancy, or The Bedford Incident, or um, Failsafe, um, Dr. Strangelove, the the very rich literature Mm -hmm. that served to warn us about how terrible it would be if we got into a war with the Soviet Union. It was cautionary fiction. And then I observed, which I believe is true, that we are in or very close to a Cold War with China. There's no body of literature. There's no serious attempt made to try and create a work of cautionary fiction. And so I went to my editor and said, hey, I think I can write this. You know, I'd written nine previous books, all nonfiction. Like you, I've hit the New York Times bestseller list a few times. But a first-time novelist is is a hard sell. Um, but I worked very hard with the editor. My my I'm with a Random House Penguin Press, and uh, they were just great with me. And what they did was they matched me up with uh, a a more experienced novelist, uh, a fiction writer, Elliot Ackerman, mm-hmm. fellow veteran, um, Silver Star, Bronze Star, um, Purple Heart in Iraq, then he becomes a CIA uh, operations officer in Afghanistan. He's probably about your age, real deal. And uh, so, but he's, he's like you, he's written five novels. And, um, and so the two of us collaborated on this um, with the idea being that we could pool our experiences, me with the geopolitics, the high level command, Mm -hmm. the White House experience, the uh, cyber, the quantum, all of that. Elliot, with his sensibilities of on the ground combat in a in a very small, constrained kind of space, and his experiences as a novelist, creating real characters. And so we kind of put that together, and the book is in your hand. And um, it's done well. You know, it 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 hit my highest, which is number six on the New York Times bestseller list, and it's being published in. Uh, 22 um, different languages. Wow. We have contracts in, and you know I can't wait to see it. You know in uh, Finnish and in yeah. Georgian, and yeah, it's kind of fun. Oh yeah, um, and in a lot of nations in Asia are publishing, and it just came out in Japan and just really has sold very well there. Wow. So um, it's it's fun writing novels, as you know better than I do, <laughs> because I, I said to somebody, and I I think you'd probably agree, it's like you. If particularly if you've been writing nonfiction your whole life where everything has to be documented and footnoted and you just, you know, if you're going to say something's a fact, you better have that right. But in fiction, you know, you get to splash a little more paint around the canvas, right? That's it. And, uh, and you get to, you get to introduce and meet and interact with real characters like, like you've done in all your novels. Yeah, that's right. And it's, uh, it, it it's interesting if, if you've, have a fact in a, in a novel, uh, and you mess it up, you can just say, ah, it was, it's fiction. That's it. <laughs> so, so it's helpful in that, uh, in that respect. Exactly. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, so it's so, I mean, this, this is great. I love this book and I read it and I listened to it. Um, so I rarely do that oh, because I'm a, you. um, I'm more, I'm a reader. I need a physical book there, yeah, me too. but for some reason it's either, I heard that it was done a little differently on the audio side, um, good. or I was yeah. driving, uh, out to LA where I had a few hours cause they're making my first novel into a series for Amazon. So I had, I, I, I listening wow. to, to books or podcasts on that, on that drive, but I really like how they did it because you have different voices with different accents yes. for all these characters. Exactly. And you don't have one narrator who's, who's right. jumping around and doing all these different voices. You actually have exactly. different voices in here. So it's more of like a exactly. stage play ish. Um, exactly. so you did, you did a great job with, uh, with that. So I highly encourage people to, that are audiobook listeners. They'll, uh, they'll love yeah. it. Cause it's a little different than most audiobooks that they're probably listening to. Yeah. Um, but I need the hard copy. I always have to do the hard copy I do as too. well. So I do too. Uh, I'm the same. So way. it's right there. By the way, speaking of which, um, we are going to pitch Netflix on 2034 in January. Oh, great. So, so stay tuned. All right. Maybe 
maybe our series can can be on at the same time. That's it. Because I think 2034 does lend itself to a series. And of course, your books are a series. What are you up to? Five? Five. Now? Just finished the fifth and I'll start number six on January 1st. So that's like... Uh, and I hope to finish it a little earlier this year. A one a, are you on kind of a one a year pace? Exactly. Track? Yep. One a year. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it seems to be going as, as as well as it could be, I guess is the best way to put it. Is this your full-time mm -hmm. work at this point? Yep. I Good went all you. in um, yeah. and I left the military. I decided to, this is what I wanted to do. And I luckily I've known that since I was seven years old or so. Um, yeah. And so I just went all, all in on it. Um, yeah. uh, of course, there are some other things and there's a connection here as well. If with Fletcher, I was looking at Fletcher, looking at St. Andrews, looking, cause I'm always interested in foreign policy and all that just because yeah. of just because I just wanted to expand my my knowledge base and, and all of that. But mm -hmm. um, I really had to go all, just like I went all in as I was getting yeah. in, getting ready to go in the Navy. Uh, and during my time yeah. in the Navy, as I was transitioning, I wanted to go all in on writing to make it the Good best novel I possibly could. So uh, so Fletcher School did not happen, but uh, uh, but the writing did. Um, so I, I feel very fortunate. Glad to see it. Glad to see it. I, um, uh, my SEAL Navy uh, Fletcher story is of the seal who got away just like you did uh and you'll know his name it's dan Crenshaw. Uh, of course so dan uh dan came up to uh you know long before he was a congressman after he got wounded mm -hmm. and then was out and uh, he was you know like thinking very seriously about fletcher so we almost got him i think he ended up actually going to harvard I instead did. i could be wrong about that uh, but I still am loosely in touch with him, and and uh, I have a lot of admiration for his character. I do too, and I you know, and regardless of what side of the aisle people are on, just to put yeah. yourself in that spotlight, especially today, yeah. where you're—I yeah. mean, it's exhausting. It seems to put yourself oh, into that political yeah. realm where you're just going to get yeah. hit not just from the fifty percent of people that don't like just your quote unquote side, but even your own side. I mean, you're just going to take yeah. hits all day long. And uh, I don't know how he does it. We, I've, I've asked him about it many times. And, you know, I guess some people can just take it, uh, can just take those hits or don't look at them as hits, maybe. Just look at them as part of this process. Did you, but. Did you actually serve with him? He's not too far off. Right. We're about, uh, we, we had some similar, we had some overlap, but we didn't serve at the yeah. same time. Uh, or at the same yeah. place, I mean, um, or at the same yeah, command. No, he's but a, uh, he's gosh, a, the, the political he's realm, scene. he is. He is, no doubt oh. about that. Yeah, polit politically, I'm not in the same place on a lot of issues, but I have I have a lot of admiration for Dan. Oh, as do I, as do I. And uh, but anybody that steps into that, it seems like either uh, why would you uh, would, like it's either drawing yeah. the wrong person sometimes because why would you want to put yourself and your family through that daily barrage of just yeah, hate, yeah. especially today? And I was going to ask you about this as well. Um, cause I've been thinking about it recently, just as I see, um, social media obviously continue to rise and, uh, not just be able to, you know, feed us certain advertisements that we might be interested in, but to, uh, yeah. control the way we, we think and influence behavior. Um, I wonder what this country would have looked like if we had social media, uh, let's say at the end of the civil war. Um, what would this country look like today? Because you can use all these things as weapons. Uh, social media is obviously used as a, a, a very effective weapon. Um, how would that have been weaponized at the end of the Civil War? And would we even be a country today using yeah. that technology to continue to divide when we needed to heal as a nation or at multiple times throughout our, our history? But that one in particular, um, it seems like I just don't know what the country would look like if we had yeah. these platforms back then. Yeah, I, I I share your concern for how it would have unfolded because we're barely holding together now, frankly, um, as a result of the way the social media have encouraged people to, to put themselves off to one side or the other and to get in their private echo chambers. And hey, I'm talking to you whether you live on Fox or whether you live on M MSNBC, um, we need to we need to come together as a nation. And, and frankly, this is where I, I like to think the veteran community can be helpful because veterans are people who value service. And all of us who are veterans ought to be encouraging Americans on both sides of the political aisle to come together the way we do in the US military, where Americans come from all socioeconomic backgrounds, all races, all parts of this country, and they work together. Um, that's a pretty good model. And so I think veterans can be part of the solution here. Service really matters. And by the way, it's not just service in the military. There are so many ways to serve this country. And we ought to celebrate 
our police, our firefighters, our diplomats, our CIA officers, our teachers, our nurses and doctors on the front line mm-hmm. of COVID. I have two son-in-laws who are physicians. They are heroes. Um, our Peace Corps volunteers, Teach for America, Volunteer for America, people serving on school boards. Boy, that's turned into blood wow. sport. Um, but they're all serving. And, and regardless of where we are politically, one way we can help bring this country together is to celebrate those who are serving. You're absolutely right. That's what made us at just that tactical level of a SEAL platoon, let's say of 16 to 24 guys somewhere in there from all places, all over the country, all socioeconomic backgrounds, but coming together, oh my goodness, that made us as strong. Uh, having having all those different people with different backgrounds because they're all bringing a different perspective to a problem set. If you have everybody with that same vision and you're looking at a target and you all come up with the same uh, it, problems with going in there, this red sell it from the outside, you're, it's all the same. Well, that's not helpful. Um, so <laughs> bringing all those people with all those different backgrounds together and putting them what on a, a problem point. set, it, uh, it only made us stronger. Um, but thank you so much for taking this time. I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, I mean, oh, 37 years in the military and then everything you've done since, all these books that you've written, in particular, this last one, because it is a cautionary tale and because we are, it, it, and it's 2034 for a reason. Uh, maybe before you go, um, you can talk about why you decided on that year in particular. Uh, first, it's a little bit of an homage to 1984, uh, Orwell's novel, which is a cautionary tale about totalitarianism. Um, secondly, as I analyze the relative balance of power between the US and China, I think it tips over in 2030-ish, which means that by a few years later, China may be much more adventurous, shall we say. And so it also comes out of analysis. And then uh, thirdly, it's just far enough in the future that um, we still have time to fix our problems, that, that we can still avoid a war with China, um, as opposed to writing a book 2024 it's right there in your face. Right. You're gonna go to war. I don't think we're there. I think we still have time to create a plan to work with China, but also to deter China, to be serious with them. And we're gonna have to do both. Hey, last thing, I, I've i got one of these wonderful pocket squares. Hey, I don't know if you've seen these. Um, they're, they're like a pocket square and you can have any of your medals done as a pocket square. So you could do your silver star, your bronze star. <laughs> Um, I have 50 medals. I picked this one. This is the Afghan service ribbon. It's for service. Everybody gets it who served in Afghanistan. And I wear it these days in a little tribute to my brothers and sisters who, uh, all of us who fought in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, that's part of who we are. And it'll be part of our history, not perhaps the most shining chapter, but We'll learn from it, we'll emerge from it, and we will come away stronger because of service. I know I'm not the only one looking for healthy snacks for me and my family, especially after a very busy 2021 as we move into 2022. And if you've been following me, you know I'm looking forward to figuring out a schedule where I'm getting a little more sleep, where I'm getting some exercise, and where I am eating right. And that is where Paleo Valley comes in. Check them out, paleovalley.com. And you can use Danger Close 15 at checkout for 15% off your order. Now, this stuff is awesome. Paleo Valley, uh, how do I know it's awesome? Because I just crushed a few of these beef sticks and these things are awesome. There's all sorts of different flavors, jalapeno, original, teriyaki, summer sausage, garlic summer sausage, and they are awesome. So Paleo Valley, thank you so much for sending these out to me. Uh, And for those that are wondering, these beef sticks are 100% grass-fed and grass-finished. Many on the market claim to be grass-fed, but actually are finished on grains. And they use beef sourced from small domestic farms in the US. This is a family-owned company, very small family-owned company. So they're making sure they do it right, that they are not cutting corners. They're prioritizing health over profit and uh, just an awesome group of people. What else do they send me here? I have these superfood bars here with grass-fed bone broth proteins, and there's all sorts of flavors here too. Pumpkin spice. How did you guys know? 
Awesome. Dark chocolate chip. <laughs> I'm going to crush those. Lemon meringue and apple cinnamon. Uh, all sorts of supplements out there. So be sure to go check out paleovalley.com. Enter clo- code danger close 15 for that 15% off your order. Once again, it's 100% grass-fed beef with higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids, vitamins and minerals, and bioavailable protein. So thank you so much. I am fired up to get move into 2022 here, and uh, this will be a part of my journey. And look at this one right here, uh, organic super greens. Oh yeah, I am all over that. So check them out, paleovalley.com, Danger Close 15 at checkout for 15% off that order. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. All right, got three things to talk about today. Where should I start? I think with Toyotas of War. If you followed me for a while, you know that I'm a big fan of the Toyota Land Cruiser. And that really started with, uh, well, I might have started with Revenge with Kevin Costner back in the day, uh, seeing him drive that in the in that film. But then I used the Hilux quite a bit overseas during my time in the military. Uh, if you go to my Instagram, at Jack Carr USA, there's a couple of pictures on there of a Hilux truck that I was using in Afghanistan early on in the war. I uh, got to use Hiluxes, uh, a bunch of other places around the world as well over my time in the military, but Toyota's a war. Awesome. You can find them on Instagram, but they have some great, you can link to a, uh, a website from there. We can get some pretty cool t-shirts, but I love these things. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for sending these. Look at that. Solid. And that one right there. So uh, really cool. Check it out. Uh, it's turned into quite the page and uh, I love checking that out uh, with each post. What else? All right. Master Chief Rick Kaiser down there at the UDT Seal Museum in Fort Pierce, Florida. This is his coin. And you can see that right there, Trident. But uh, hopefully have him on the podcast at some point to talk about his time in the military and what he's doing now at the UDT Seal Museum in Fort Pierce, Florida. And if you have not been down there, highly recommend you check it out. If you have kids, take the kids down there amazing history of special operations as it pertains to all the conflicts that we've been involved in as a country over time. And uh, they've done a fantastic job with it. So Rick, thank you for what you've done with that museum. Thank you for everything that you did for the nation in the military. And thank you for this coin. Awesome. What else? Ah, this watch, Winfield Watch Company. So I think they're winfieldwatch.com online. And look at that watch right there. My friend James Yeager introduced me to these guys, and James was a guest on the podcast not too long ago. You can go back and check that out, but uh, what a cool watch. Uh, And the guy that started it has military roots, so I love that as well. And uh, yeah, if you've been following me for a while, you know I'm a watch person. So uh, Winfield Watch Company, thank you guys so much. What sets elite performers like Fortune 500 CEOs, Navy SEALs? record-breaking athletes, and cultural influencers. Apart from everyone else, how did some of the most successful people in the world get to where they are today? And how can you use their insights to pursue your own big goals and aspirations? Well, on Ironclad's new original podcast, One Week Challenge, we ask them. Each week, we bring different guests to issue a one-week challenge to listeners that will help them take their lives, careers, minds, and fitness to the next level. One of the ideas that Ironcloud was founded on is the belief that iron sharpens iron. That's why in each episode, you'll hear from some of the world's most high-performing leaders who will issue practical, thoughtful challenges to listeners that can be completed over the course of a single week. Subscribe now to One Week Challenge, an Ironcloud original series, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironcloud original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. You can find out more about Admiral Stavridis on Twitter at S-T-A-V-R-I-D-I-S-J. And you can go to his website, which is AdmiralStav.com. Find out about all his other books and everything else that he has going on there. If you liked our conversation, please leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe. And you can also go to officialjackcar.com to find out about what I have going on. You can hit the gear section to go to Jack Carr USA to check out the merch. And my next novel, In the Blood, is available for pre-order now. That's coming out May 31st, 2022. You can find me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. Until the next time, 
Take care. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting.